First of all, a welcome to Dr. Sharani Rajlish, a senior IAS officer from the government of Karnataka, and also welcome to Jessica, whom we've known for many years, both of whom we've known for many years. Uh, let me just set up a little bit of context to this theme, uh, and then have Sharani lead off with about 10 or 15 minutes of uh, her point of view on it, and following followed by Jessica. And then we will have, I think, sufficient time to have an open house and a discussion before we close. Uh, I'd like to close exactly at three so that we give enough time for the next panel. Uh, so the background to this is, uh, since Shalini wasn't with us in the morning, this is the report is a study of what we call the citizenship, an attempt to try and create a measure of citizenship, which we call the citizenship index. It's a result of several years of partnership between uh, Janagraha and Brown University. What we discussed in the morning was the results of the first study done in Bangalore with about 4,000 sample size, fairly large sample size. And the conclusions uh, were, I would say, broadly in two buckets. One is that overall level of citizenship as measured by two sub-components, knowledge and participation. Overall level of citizenship on average was 0.32 on a score of one, or we can say 32% on a scale of 100. And then there are variations between different castes variations, religious variations, and class variations. The biggest of these is the class variation, that people who are poorer living in uh, informal settlements have much lower levels of citizenship than those who are richer. The second part of the study was the relationship between levels of citizenship and levels of service delivery as measured by four public services. And uh, there are several conclusions. One of the key conclusions of that is that the poor especially are able to get better outcomes of service delivery when they have better levels of citizenship. So that's one of the key conclusions and I won't go into too much of the details of it. But a lot of the morning's discussion touched upon the theme that we would like to explore in this next one hour, which is, is there low levels of citizenship, especially on participation and engagement? because people have inherent challenges of engaging or is it a reflection of government's uh, failure to offer opportunities for people to participate and this is especially true in the urban areas. So the broader theme for this topic is given that there's a lot of political space available to people in rural areas to participate and we'll come back to whether they actually use those spaces or not but there are formal political space and mechanisms available. How come that that space is not available in urban areas? And what can be done about it uh, in a systematic way? What are the possible ideas and so on? With that background, let me just give a few more pieces of data. We've been doing this for about 14 years. Our first campaign was in 2001. Based on the experience of that first campaign, which was a campaign on participatory budgeting, what we realized, the first year of the campaign was a quote-unquote success. And what we mean by that is there were that time only 100 wards in Bangalore. Out of those 100 wards, there was a fair degree of participation. And I would say a lot of it was more middle class than the poor. There are other constraints that the poor have to participate. We attempted that in subsequent campaigns to get their voice in the budget. And uh, only one item of the budget was chosen, which was ward works. At that time, each ward had approximately 50 lakhs of rupees allocated. So across 100 wards, there were 50 crores of rupees allocated. And we said, let's not worry about participating in the overall budget. Let's at least participate in one line item of the budget, which is reflecting local priorities. Uh, it was a demand side initiative. It was, it was the, the call to action was to ask citizens to connect with their corporators and connect with their local communities. And then, because there was no formal space, that campaign ended in a, uh, took about seven months. At the end of it, out of 50 crores of total allocation, 10.7 crores of projects uh, in about 22 wards were done with fairly substantial amount of citizen involvement with prioritization. Obviously, citizens identified 150 crores worth of projects and they had to negotiate among themselves before they negotiated with the corporators. This campaign failed miserably in its second year. And the reason it failed, there were many reasons. The primary reason was because there was no formalized space 
for this kind of an engagement so what we had going for us in the first year was what you could call a surprise factor that the system both political as well as administrative had not expected a fairly well organized concerted approach to get this done but the moment that first campaign was done pretty much it was out in the open and barriers had been put up these are not unexpected as we think about this now clearly nobody likes to share power MLAs don't like to share power with corporators. Why would corporators want to share power with citizens? So it's not surprising, which is where the institutional question comes up. So let me just set up the uh, rural urban question and then hand over to you. Karnataka is a pioneer of Panchayati Raj. One of the key instruments, institutional platforms there is the Gram Sabha. And it finds mention in the constitutional amendment of the 73rd amendment where they say the gram sabha is made up of every registered voter of a gram panchayat now if we compare it to the 74th amendment there is actually a congenital flaw there because the 74th amendment talks not about a nagar sabha but about a ward or a wards committee and the ward or wards committee is made up of representatives of the voters so we have removed the sabha concept so in some sense if you think of a ladder of participation where the ground floor is the platform for the voters, the sabha of all the registered voters, that ground floor is missing in the urban area and there's only the first floor. Now we've, in the several years since then, gone back to the people who wrote this because it was originally the 65th, 64th and 65th amendments and Rajiv Gandhi, despite having two-thirds majority, couldn't pass it, which shows the level of political pushback on decentralization. And the response we got from those who actually crafted it was, well, urban voters don't need all this. They don't have time, they don't care, they don't need to do this. So we did not put this in. Now, whether urban voters choose to participate or not is a separate question. The opportunity to engage in some formal way would have been nice to have been available and one would argue is statutorily required. So in a bizarre way, the urban voter in India is a second class citizen compared to the rural voter, not in terms of access to services, but in access to this sense of identity as a citizen, because that space to express oneself is somewhat limited. So that's the background context. Many of you may not know, but the doctor in Dr. Shalini Rajneesh is a PhD in Panchayati Raj. So, so with that, uh, let me just hand over to you to say, and if you can comment freely about you know the political economy challenges of actually seeing something like this why is it that we have this lopsided thing uh, between rural and urban what can be done about it and so on thank you <clears throat> the phd hypothesis that i had was about 22 years old and that's the time when 74th amendment uh, uh, 73rd amendment had happened it's 1992 and after that i was working in dakshin kannada those of you who are familiar with Dakshin Kannada is a is a different different uh, ball game altogether. People are highly literate, very active, very empowered due to their certain historical factors. So it's very different from rest of Karnataka. So my flaw in hypothesis making was that I took Dakshin Kannada as a sample and I made certain predictions based on that and recommendations also. I found that people were very actively involved in Gram Sabha level and particularly women. Incidentally, that time the Sakshartha Abhyan was, that is literacy mission, was also on. So many women, particularly, even old women who were totally illiterate, they were all getting, uh, you know, in, involved in this uh, whole mission of, you know, getting literate and empowered. And the strategy that we from government side followed was that give them uh, usable skills, which help them learn literacy, you know, being literate. That means you open a bank account and you learn to sign and that empowers you and also makes you literate rather than taking them to A, B, C, D, right? So that found a huge acceptance and they were all in that movement. And as a result, as they gained each and every department's programs were being uh, told to them in their Sakshata class, in their literacy uh, classes. So as a result, they knew what agriculture, what horticulture, what industry, what all these departments had to offer. That was the you know, uh, stage by, uh, in which my research happened and I found that not just the uh, voter or the, uh, the, the individual citizen was uh, so empowered by the whole process of uh, uh, 
decentralization of uh, politics but the even the panchayati raj representatives they were also equally active because if your if your clientele is active you have to reci respond and reciprocate in the same uh, vein and as a result we also found that many of these women who were playing active role in literacy were, uh, and in uh, self help uh, self help group of women uh, you know uh, empowerment were also getting elected as panchayati raj uh, representatives and in dakshin kannada for example the percentage of women elected representatives as gram panchayat members was as high as 45% while the uh, reservation was only 33% why i am putting this all together is with this these kind of factors in mind uh, the the uh, analysis that i made was that three d's said decentralization leads to uh, uh, sorry democratization leads to and leading to um, decentralization and then that leads to development that means you had democracy anyway we got decentralized democracy in the uh, panchayati raj format and that has led to people's involvement which has led to lot of development and what you are mentioning your action plan 1 people were coming forward in communities to build their own houses uh, in, sorry not houses the uh, schools school buildings additional school buildings or toilets or roads or culverts you know small small things which were supposed to take place this is a huge you know uh, movement of people for their own development and that's what made me recommend that this is the you know panacea and in uh, coming years this uh, is going to change the face of our rural uh, development and is going to be for the better but 20 years later i became panchayati raj secretary of the karnataka state and i had to revise and re <laughs> my my own recommendations and views it didn't happen it didn't happen because of course i had made those as part of recommendations unless you make people's involvement as a mandatory exercise proactively ensured by the local self government the huge ideals of uh, decentralization will never materialize in dakshin kannada it happened because of its own context but in other districts particularly north karnataka districts again where literacy levels were low women empowerment index was low this did not happen which means that coming to your citizenship index there are two coins uh, two two sides of the coin one is rights and another is duty as a right what you talked about whether i am participating in governance whether i am getting the benefits from uh, the government uh, programs is my right as a citizen but th then i also have duties am i participating in decision making am i contributing to the uh, the overall development of my own village area or neighborhood for example uh, uh, sanitation these days we have swachhata abhiyan is it not my duty so there also as a citizen i have certain role to play but how many of us actually play we, how many of us ensure that we don't throw things you know around which includes both educated and uneducated so it's it's a question of you know the the total bringing up of our uh, people in terms of two things one is how the government treats you how the government involves you the second is as a society how organized you are now you may be absolutely illiterate i i see that inverse relationship between the illiterate and the uh, the illiterate poor and the low, low uh, citizenship ind index you may be illiterate you may be poor but if you are organized you certainly will will be much higher in terms of your involvement in day to day affairs of governance as well as your own development how participative is our development we are we are we are quite at a big question mark coming to the second point i have also worked as ceo of zilla panchayat i'll just take that as a reference because same thing can be translated into urban development how you can make a difference there may be things which are not statutorily available as you pointed out in urban areas but what we did we made certain uh, mandatory um, uh, you know directions to the gram panchayats that whenever you hold gram sabhas you shall indicate what all you have done in the last one year or six months or whatever to bring in that transparency we forced it upon them so when the person reads out the panchayat secretary for example reads out that in the last six months or one year this road this building and how much was spent on this when it is said in the open there is a, a total empowerment as far as the group is concerned so if it has not happened they will immediately shout at you for the fear of being shouted at you will not do the wrong thing isn't it 
Not only that, reading out, we also ensured that even now you go to any village panchayat, you will find adarsh takte, which means an abstract of the statistics. So you know in this village what is the population, literate, illiterate, school, in infrastructure and so on. Or government land and things like that. Which a common man or woman is supposed to know. This is where you know you make a proactive step. You ensure that the people are equally aware. And that awareness is what I feel that uh, either the government has to you know, reach out or the organized citizens, which means the NGOs and people like, and organizations like Janagraha, they, they play a very vital role in bringing people together, bringing them on that empowerment more by giving them the awareness about things they need to know about themselves and their own development and how to do it. If these two things happen, the poor and uh, unempowered citizens certainly will rise in the citizenship index. I'll give you one another small example. In Panchayati Raj, in the rural area, it is mandatory that any beneficiary that has to be selected under any scheme of the government has to be done in that open Gram Sabha. Now, people have made farce of that also, but at least that mandate is there, which means you can't just, you know, put anybody's name in any scheme and all that. So it is, it is known to everybody. So even if that person may, ha may not have participated in the uh, proceedings of the Gram Sabha, somebody, his friend or somebody can, or the NGO who represents that uh, group or class, will be able to tell, look, your name is there or your name is not there. And then take it to the further um, step that if somebody's name is not there, then this, the second step is to ensure that you are there. So you take to whatever your application or your pressure group, or whichever approach level that you want to do, but you ensure that you are there. Now, what we have done on the services side, again, a Karnataka government initiative, which has not even, uh, not only got a national level recognition, but an international level recognition, that is on the services. Now, why citizenship index is poor? Reason is that we talk of citizenship in a limited sense of having the franchise, the, the right to vote. And that makes you a king for one day whichever day that election is in your uh, jurisdiction. But rest of the 364 days, who are you? You are one, you know, not to be bothered about. And that's where citizenship in index goes down. How do you make a citizen king or queen 365 days, round the clock? And that is what Karnataka government did by giving right to services to all citizens, irrespective of caste, creed, color, class, whatever. And the act empowers each citizen to ask for any government service under different departments in a time-bound manner. And if they don't give that service, it is the government employee who has been made now responsible to pay as a fine to the citizen to compensate him for the delay that has happened. This is something which is an empowering tool and it has come through a legislative route. Therefore, if you have this kind of an empowerment strategy which can possibly come only from the government side, across board, the citizens certainly can feel much more empowered and much more involved. One of the major reasons that I conducted a lot of surveys trying to find out why those people who are not coming forward into um, involving themselves actively is that one negative kind of a thing. Nothing will happen. There is no use. Uh, nobody will respond. And that sense of powerlessness, right? Once these kind of tools are taken to the people uh, who need them, certainly it can make a huge difference. And I have found illiterate, poor, totally disorganized people coming and claiming with a, you know, a, a thump on the table, no, you have to give me uh, this service uh, within this time and you have failed to give me this service, therefore you pay me the fine of some 500 rupees or whatever. Now this is the kind of change that come, can come in provided there is a tool given to the, in the hands of the people to their made to know how to use that tool. For which organization like this and people who are more uh, you know, actively involved have to play a huge, big role as a bridge, creating that bridge. Otherwise, tool will remain where it is, probably in the legislative that book, law book, and uh, empowerment will remain again probably in researches and uh, books and theories. So this is, this is where I, I personally feel that it's a very good uh, attempt, an excellent uh, organized systematic way of uh, analyzing where we lack uh, the, the, uh, uh, the that empowerment you know, gap is there. 
and what we need to do certainly government has a huge takeaway from here all departments in urban governance have to uh, pitch in a proactive kind of a measure to see to it that those who are unempowered and who require that input from the state government are reached out and one very new measure which is yet to take but it is under the process of formation which i am now taking up as uh, principal secretary of backward classes department is to conduct a survey of all the people all the citizens so to say citizens is not the right word but all the people who stay in karnataka it's about 6.21 crore uh, people and this is going to take place in a span of one month's time and we're taking 55 indicators i will take a look at the indicators that you have also given but basically it is talking about the social and educational and economic uh, parameters why a particular person has remained backward all these years due to the educational and uh, social uh, you know uh, backwardness or or uh, deprivation and then this will become one stop shop for all database relating to individual person linked to his aadhar card his voter id his door number his phone number and so on so it's it's going to link everything otherwise we unfortunately have databases which are stand alone islands of excellence and when we try to relate the two uh, very difficult to match them so the idea is to converge all databases together put it on the public portal for a total transparency anybody and everybody what you are doing a 10000 sample my 6 crore 20 lakh sample will be on on the portal with individual detail on 55 parameters where we will then use research uh, uh, you know institutions to do more of this matrix you know and say all right because this person was of this caste or sub caste and was living in this forest area in this particular north karnataka region he or she never had uh, an opportunity to go to a school and he or she was ostracized on this this ground and therefore remained backward for so many years and so on you know what and is in this occup occupational uh, hazard or things like that and that would then lead to very positive affirmative steps from different departments of the state to ensure that if one person is sightless houseless no education no uh, uh, let us say um, employment all these schemes are put together to ensure that that person is fully empowered in socio economic sense and therefore becomes an active participant in uh, the uh, the overall development of the state thank you No, actually, I was also asked to explain a little bit about myself and where I'm coming from. So you don't uh, sort of say, "What is this Vermonter sitting here talking about um, Indian cities and citizenship and engagement?" Uh, so I've been studying essentially institutional design for transferring cash, or transforming cash into some form of public good for about 20 years, starting out with demand-driven social investment funds in rural villages in Peru. um and moving in through theoretical work for my dissertation on decision making under imperfect information my entry into india as you'll soon see from one of the comments i'm about to offer was in looking at infrastructure delivery and the policy regulation and especially financing of infrastructure delivery and i think one of the things and, and so now i live and work in chennai um partly with iit madras and partly with a, an institutional design research group that i set up there But I think one of the things that struck me about this morning's discussion and I have to say that the original question that we were asked for this panel was to was to actually talk about these mechanisms for engagement and to noting the findings of the study that in between elections or in between voting engagement appeared to be low number 1 as measured by by the survey and number 2 that we did we are seeing the rise of other forms of citizen engagement and at least the public discourse um in usually in the aftermath of uh terrible events um and it's been something that that's you know there's been a fair amount of commentary and so the very broad question that we were asked was how to increase citizen engagement number 1 and number 2 what is the potential role of of technology in doing this and it struck me from this morning's discussion and also just in the sense of being constructive about the next round of the survey that that the question of engagement in a from a research perspective can people hear me if i unless i lift up the mic can you hear me 
Okay. Um, the question of engagement needs to be studied with a close look at both the supply side and the demand side. This is a very demand side piece of research, but the supply side for infrastructure and services, which I agree are an essential focus in the sense of, of capabilities and capabilities for exercising both, you know, for seizing economic activity as well as making India's urban areas wonderful places to live. But the production of infrastructure and the provision of services in India cities has two characteristics that have been in the background that we haven't brought up. Number one, there's an incredibly large amount of state and centralized funding, especially, and, and I anticipate that that will probably only continue with at least what seems to be the policy discourse around the development of the new smarter cities, the addressing of census towns, basically India's next wave of urbanization, that this pattern of um, not a neat, self-contained, local, political realm to be tapped into, even if one did have fully deliberative bodies, that, there, that there's a significant amount of upward accountability, and that creates new opportunity, or different opportunities for the kind of strategic engagement and what is the overall larger design of our settlement. Number two is that um, the production of infrastructure, there, you know, there's a significant difference between demanding services from networks that already exist and from building new networks and making decisions about new forms of provision. So where would water networks expand? Where are sewage treatment plants going in? Uh, what forms of electricity generation are going to come up? What forms of mobility? I mean, the question here, the survey here was about roads, but also questions about the access to mobility services within a city are all things that, are, that, that the, that process of in, infusing citizenship and the representation of citizens as creators and collaborators in creating the, these areas where people live it is something that's a little bit different than the types of engagement that was asked in this survey. So one of the things that I would suggest to just put it out there, this is somewhat following on Partha's comments, is that we start to think about three different levels of engagement to study or three different classes of engagement. So one would be on the strategic and the political level. So at the outset, what are the kinds of distributional decisions that can be made? What types of consultation about the broad vision for an area um, for decisions about whether to invest in, say, roads or public transport? Those kinds of very broad, almost vision level settings. And, and, and I think Janagra has done an enormous amount of work in this. And I actually met Ramesh and Swati around the time of the proof campaign, coming straight out of being a Latin Americanist and thinking, oh, wow, here we have this in, in India as well. Um, but I think that that strategic level, the criteria for thinking about how do you strengthen that and how can you use technology um, to do that is there's a lot around um, creating more and more informed citizenry, tracking some of the outcomes of the deliberations and making sure that um, they actually get held up against the, I mean, the kinds of initiatives that Dr. Shalini was speaking about, making sure that people are accountable for what they promised to. That's something that is becoming increasingly easy, but it often even comes down to just translation. I mean, we ran, um, when in one of my old employers in Chennai, we ran the informal sector consultation for the city development plan under Jan and Yoram. And that was one of the things that, that we were struck by is, number one, so this is a statutory process that was not real, that was going to be done in sort of a check the box manner. We actually got 170 people together to discuss and debate different aspects of the city development plan. And um, one of the things that came up is we, we actually, we, all we did was we translated some of the publicly available English documentation about expenditure into Tamil and did some um, graphs. And you could see people passing the papers around that it was a level of information that transparency by putting something up on a website just didn't work. And this is a lesson you know well, but it's something that I think when you're looking at the strategic level of engagement, those are the kinds of interventions that are extremely important. But and, and the second level, though, is this almost tactical level of engagement, which is how do we make sure that citizens, and especially the poor, especially those who don't necessarily have a fixed address, who now have an other number, but may not even show up in what the state, so state broadly speaking, not necessarily state, city, center, state, local, what the state can see about the city. So it, in a lot of, I don't know about the situation in Bangalore, but in Chennai, I know parts of the water distribution network are simply unmapped. They just don't know where they are. So if you're thinking about where the leakage is and how do you prioritize where the leakages are, where are people getting water, not getting water, 
those are the kinds of things where the, the data that the city has with it is, is not necessarily going to either tell the answer or represent some of the groups of people who may be most affected. So are there ways to enhance the, the, you know, the statistical agency of people who would like to express themselves as residents and citizens but aren't showing up on the maps that drive a lot of the everyday um, both investment prioritization as well as the, the internal sense of having met citizen service level benchmarks. And these are the kinds of things where the, the questions on engagement and what are the boundaries of technology have to do with who has access to, say, um, being able to feed things back into a, a smartphone. Are some of these processes exclusionary? And I think there are a lot of lessons, a lot of really interesting forms of engagement that are coming up out of the social sector um, that, are, that have a real potential to enhance the, a, a kind of an odd form of citizenship which says, hey, I'm here, this area that I live in is actually a slum that does not have these types of services. I may not be on your map, but I exist, and here's the demonstration in front of a larger audience that I do exist. And you see a lot of this in um, environmental quality, for example. I mean, if you look at water quality mapping, um, a lot of the most interesting things on, on say, micropollutants and the very geographically granular work on micropollutants is coming from citizen science. If you look at air quality, um, there's an Indian group, uh, Urban Emissions, that has fairly granular maps on air quality that they're doing with a mix of public and private sensor data. The costs of this are, are going down, and the perspective that is now possible from increasingly lower income groups being able to adopt scientific standard technology and say, look, this is my perspective on what the problem is. Now we have a different understanding of what the city is and what the problem is. Is almost a tactical level of engagement that doesn't have a statutory backing but I think can be increasingly powerful. So that's, the, that's kind of the second area. And then the third is to, is to think separately about these kind of emergency fire alarm types of responses. Because it looked like the surveys were actually asking more about the emergency fire alarm types of responses. If something's not working, do citizens, have, do citizens feel like they have the standing to make it worth their time to go and you know, talk to the engineer, submit a complaint, um, do you know, access in some ways express the emergency that they as individuals are facing. And I think being able to separate those analytically and explore those um, using a distinct set of questionnaires and with a distinct set of expectations for what are the problems and what are the obstacles might be a very good way to map out different forms of engagement along the production of infrastructure and services and to be able to understand what are the things that what are the things that groups of different scales can do? What are the things that require sovereign authority? What are the things that can be led through a uh, non-governmental but clever informational campaign? And it might give a very good um, mapping of how different people who care about these settlements uh, can, can be productive in fostering engagement, rather than trying to conflate these three quite distinct levels of participation in the creation of urban areas. Um, there are a ton of, I think one of the things that's kind of challenging about um, advocating this kind of agenda is that much of the data, much of the measurement of cities and the creation of metrics to assess standards that's being done in the name of, of greater performance, so the service level benchmarks, are admirable, but they're seen as, as sort of dry and apolitical. Whereas the reality is that how things are measured and the level of spatial resolution that we have in the measurement of performance, um, even just within small blocks, can be incredibly political at hiding problems, and in particular hiding problems that no amount of, of you know, direct action from citizenship is really going to change. And that we have to be cognizant that Indian cities, because of the way that, the, that a lot of the, the action is dominated by public expenditure, public investment rules, um, and because of the really pretty poor underlying information base have both a gap and an incredible opportunity to engage through this kind of advocacy. If I am, as I'm listening to both of you, it seems like the way we constructed this uh, was too thin, both on the dimensions of knowledge as well as participation. Uh, we've thought about it, and at least the way I framed my question to you was about formal platforms of participation. And what, uh, Shalini, in your example, you gave a few, like the uh, Sakala was about 
mandating a certain level of service provision and then making that information available to citizens and then making them place demands on the state to then say that this is what we want. Uh, there's both the you know the the knowledge piece. You want to make sure that that gets more widely disseminated so that the demand on the state increases, so the claims on the state can increase. And there's a lot of things that can happen on the knowledge front. And Jessica, your examples open up the possibility both on the knowledge piece, multiple instruments of knowledge and the way to disseminate it, but also on the participation front that it doesn't have to be a formal structured form of participation, that there can be multiple ways by which uh, engagement and participation can increase levels of citizenship. So even without, even without legislation. Yeah. One cautionary note, and it's this may be coming from, I think, the current enthusiasm about citizen-led and kind of non-governmental action, that we should not think that a tweet chat is a substitute for an area suba, that there is an extremely important sure. role for And that came up in the morning session as well. And the, we have to hi hold you know, that level of participation to a very high sovereign rigor. Correct. Um, I guess the one uh, unstated point here is that when we have, I guess the comfort that people have with formal structures is that they're inherently equitable. Even if the poor are not able to access them, there is an ability to then mandate that access and then ensure that that gets done and make that claim of the state. And the challenge with other mechanisms, including the ones that Janagraha itself uses, is that there is no such formal mandate and therefore it falls upon the moral compass of the intermediaries to ensure that those kinds of you know, equitable outcomes happen. So let me just uh, throw it open for uh, questions, comments, observations to both Shalini and Jessica. Uh, even as I'm throwing it open, one of the nice things that has come out in this partnership between Brown and Janagraha is exactly this, that it is, this project is both simultaneously a research inquiry into a very important subject on measuring urban citizenship but at the same time, it has normative implications and practical you know, implications for those of us who work on the ground and can connect it back into policy and so on. So uh, it's an unusual yin-yang that you would normally not see in a typical research project. Comment really, but validates a lot of what both of you have had to say. Uh, Delhi didn't have a, you know, a third tier of governance, so to say. We don't have elected uh, representatives. Uh, so what the government really did was that it partnered with about 150 NGOs on the ground, uh, setting, up, setting them up as information dissemination centers. And the academic in me and the critical academic in me, when this was being done, was very, very wary of this being done and that all that an NGO would be doing was having information about various schemes. But four years down the line, the change that you see in the city is really about the change that was brought about by these NGOs and most of the national parties as also the fledgling AAP party, the AAP party was also built on the cadre coming out of these NGOs and uh, the effectiveness of a lot of the schemes or the ineffectiveness, in fact Nilekani's UID you know, is uh, universal in its appeal and embrace but by the end the client capture was such that people could be in queues for seven hours and intermediaries have very novel ways of not letting you get to the state. But the real visual sighting, when people can see change, the visual sighting that you could get to a camera and you get across that boundary and then you are in the ambit of the state rather than the informality, that was breaking down a number of held assumptions that we had had about the urban until now. The second important effect was that a lot of the oppositional domain that existed, I mean Delhi had knowledge about the failure of the urban, the air quality, etc. And because of pressures through the court, uh, you know, something would be done, etc. Now, all of that changed to a certain extent. The court was not the arbiter of the destinies of the city, but the people and their pressure was. And I think it's important in India to realize that, you know, when the arena of the court gets flooded with what are really civil disputes, either between lower order authorities or between citizens themselves, that's not a method of functioning of the city. So, what I realized was that the power taking away from the domain of the courts actually increase citizen power uh, with the city. So there are many intangibles of participation which flow really as unanticipated, can't really be seen from what the formal tenets of theory may ask us to do, 
but they do allow a re-engagement and negotiation with the city with the bottom particularly opened up in ways in which we at, at least don't know how or why this happened but it did happen bengaluru should uh, follow that delhi model you know our our uh, rwas are not allowed to even exist you know and the corporators they don't want it so even if this this best practice is available to you know replicate the sharing of power is a problem so it's not that the problem stops at that if the state government decides that it has to be done like what was delhi, done in delhi same thing can be done for a bigger city like whether it is bengaluru or chennai can you say a bit more about the uh, first and second uh, let me i understand the what you call uh, uh, fire alarms so the, the uh, yeah so first is this broad level you call it strategic engagement first level, so can you just elaborate a bit more yeah. i mean i think first level corresponds to what you know people who are maybe coming from a uh, european north american um, Latin American view of city governance. I mean, there's sort of if mayors ruled the world kind of idea of a coherent, compact political sphere. The strategic level will probably correspond to that kind of electoral politics, the longer arm of accountability, that there are these opportunities for citizen deliberation on what should the larger vision for the city be, um, things like participatory long-run budgeting, um, things like discussion of differences between alternate urban plans, the kinds of consultations that are embedded in the city development plans now, I would put in that strategic category. So it's probably the most kind of classically political. The, the tactical part is, you know, I think one of the illustrations is um, unified transport ticketing. This is different from, let's say, the right to access specific services. But it's much more about a 20-year shaping of what happens to the spatial future and therefore the development future. Because that plan is going to define the shape of how the city will evolve, but also the allocation of network infrastructure like water, mobility networks, and so on. So in that sense, it's a different category than asking for water supply or roads or uh, electricity for my neighborhood or for my home. Yeah. And I mean, even if you say voting, if, if you actually had more elected mayors voting on the comparison of the mayoral platforms and their vision for the city, that would be at the strategic level. The tactical level is much more um, everyday give and, give and take of information. So not citizens as rights-bearing individuals, but citizens as information-bearing individuals whose information is valuable for the operation of the city. And I think that um, that sounds very dire, but if you think about something like unified ticketing for, for transport, if you actually can track people's movements and differences in demand over time of day, as well as geographies, you can do a lot better job at meeting changes in needs, at meeting commuter patterns, and at meeting low-income area patterns. But you have to have that information. So you have citizens as pro, you know, sort of incidental providers of information that in turn also helps them be recognized in the provisioning for, for civil services, which isn't traditionally a political action, but I think particularly in the context of how Indian cities work and seem to be slated to work, it's an essential form of representation. So even in Bangalore, there are pockets of excellence uh, which has been created by people like uh, Ramesh. And I mean, we had a group called City Connect where in the tender sure roads were designed and you know the government has accepted it. I think it's a very good example of citizen participation. Same way in electronic city, we've been managing the electronic city by the association for almost 20 plus years, uh, practically on our own. Uh, yeah. And now of course they have given made it into an urban local body, carved it out of this. It's a very good example I'm telling you. That kind of you know replication of or using the interested people see for example the only danger as in the mornings the discussion was there the elitist sort of you know hijacking the whole thing if it if the government makes certain uh, uh, you know um, uh, constructs to not to happen that and it is equitably available for everybody and these kind of uh, interested people should be kind of you know encouraged so that you see, for example, Bangalore is a 
huge elephant. No one uh, BBMP or one uh, secretary, one principal secretary, because we have been managing 900 acres. 900 acres is nothing compared to what Bangalore is. I know how it is difficult, how to get citizen participation is also very difficult. I think we should encourage this kind of part pockets of excellence and pockets of excellent people who are interested genuinely. And uh, ca uh, caution is not to make it elitist, that's all. I think that would be definitely helpful. Somewhere you have to convince the corporator that it is in your best interest to share power. Somewhere, some strategy has to be used. And there are there are corporators I have seen who are whosoever is doing this kind of participative you know, exercise is developing the wards to a large extent. And and is also getting re-elected. Lots of opposition. Lots of opposition. Finally, when it is made, I mean, you know, uh, things are, things work out. It is like, you know, there are so many private people who develop their estates, their things. There are pockets of excellence in Bangalore or anywhere in, in India. But that has to expand, in my scaling opinion. Scaling up. Scaling up is a challenge. Scaling up and expanding and, and having the same kind of interest. See, if government, government is a body which has got uh, equitable, I mean, you know, uh, equitable approach to everybody. But only problem is the, the effectiveness and the efficiency of the government is in question. Private sectors, yes, they are very efficient. But the only problem we have to worry about is hijacking. I think if we can ma if we can manage balance the both, I think uh, there is excellence here. It has to be tapped. I think people like you should do it. <laughs> Waiting for the opportunity. <laughs> uh, either of you, or both of you, uh, say something about, um, uh, or if you have reflections on the ways in which um, Chennai and uh, Bangalore are different in their local urban governance. Our chief minister is, um, well, we all know. So on, a, on an urban level, without getting into state level politics and the kind of the usual structure of appointed, well, not really elected mayors, urban, I actually think that, that some, of the, some of the major challenges of governing uh, administratively fragmented area under it, with kind of a politically charged party backdrop are actually in common between the two. Um, I think that some of what has happened with Chennai having room to expand to the south um, is actually also, again, quite similar to Bangalore's opportunity to expand along the Bangalore-Chennai corridor and expand also outside of the, the core urban area to develop new, um, I guess, privately serviced almost escape valve areas. Um, so I think that's another similarity. I think that the type of citizen engagement, um, so City Connect, we actually have a chapter of City Connect in Chennai as well, and one of the things, actually Ramesh and I were just speaking about, that one of the things that, that I think this, that City Connect and, and Bangalore do well is to be an outside, reasonably respected provider of expertise into kind of a sovereign, like a, a decision-making opportunity that's been created within the state. So in transport governance, for example, the private side of, of City Connect will take international domestic expertise, they'll do traffic projection studies, they'll look at widening of roads and so on. And what the state has done for its part is not really set up a unified metropolitan transport authority, but at the same time, get everybody who needs to take a call on something lined up, get the commissioner lined up, get the chief secretary lined up. And when a reasonable option comes through, sign off on it and help make it happen. That's been Again, as a you know, as a as someone who started out in political science, actually Ashutosh was one of my first teacher on India. Um, that that's a horrible situation. It's just ripe for capture and everything else. But it seems to be fairly functional in the milieu of both cities. And I know there are accusations on both sides that City Connect is elitist, and I think some of the things that are similar that have come out in Bangalore have suffered from similar criticisms. But I'd actually say that there that I can't think of too many you know, major differences. Um, so it could just be we're both typically southern Indian cities. I find two major differences uh, between Chennai and Bengaluru. The um, rate of growth in Bengaluru and the complexity and heterogeneity 
is huge compared to Chennai, and therefore the challenges are much higher. The integrative, you know, that force is missing. In in any any you know square feet area that you find, you don't find two people similar, and therefore the forces to put them together is very difficult. Rate of growth is so huge that you can't match up with the infrastructure. And that's why we have the wars, and unfortunately the management is not keeping pace with it. So I think there's two. That's what because there is integration. Is integration here? There is so much of heterogeneity. Very difficult to bring them together, as as things stand. Not that anything is impossible; it can be done, but that's how it stands. Um, Shalini's last point actually is not very well known. Everybody knows qualitatively that Bangalore is a very fast-growing city, but between Census 2001 and Census 2011, it was the second fastest-growing district in the country, and the first, and on a base of 45 lakh people. to be the second fastest growing city in the district in the country is an extraordinary scale change that uh, is difficult to comprehend because the fastest growing was a district which had a base population of under 5 lakhs so i don't think there is any other city arguably in the world that has grown as much in the last two decades as bangalore has and with that comes all of the other challenges as well there's no letting anybody off the hook but the reality is this is an incredibly fast growing city both in population terms and in spatial terms and all of the concomitant challenges both of service delivery and of participation is what we see